session, which is about technology and innovation. For the last day and a half, we've been hearing a lot of requests or a lot of curiosity on tech and innovation. Um, how does it help or how does it affect or how does it accelerate the circular economy? And our first speaker is Mark Lepage. He has been, he has worked in the knowledge and technology innovation for development since 1998. Mark currently works in ADB as the Principal IT Specialist for Tech and Innovation based at the ADB headquarters in Manila, Philippines. So he advises and supports ADB with the 2030 Digital Agenda by designing and implementing ADB's Digital Learning Labs program, which you'll hear more about later. It's an initiative aiming exploring emerging digital technologies like artificial intelligence, blockchain, and robotics to future-proof ADB and support developing member countries interested in testing digital innovation in a safe environment. Let's welcome Mark. Thank you very much, uh, Anna and uh, colleagues, for inviting me here. So hi, good afternoon. So my name is Mark. Um, I'm with the IT department working on digital. So typically, we work on internal stuff, but I'm very happy to share some of my previous experience or some stuff we've been discussing, sorry, with, uh, with different colleagues around circular economy um, and the use of digital technology. I think part of the conversation is precisely it's not only about digital technology in, in innovation. Um, sorry, I broke a pair of glasses two days ago. This is my last one, so uh, got to be careful. Uh, so yesterday um, I joined, and this was very interesting. I'm not a circular economy person now, so I got all excited when you started talking about GPT, you know, generative pre-training and chat GPT. I'm like, yeah, this is cool. No, this is a different GPT that you're talking about here. So, uh, so yes, this is GPT generated. This is an image that I got um, a few days ago when I was trying to do some research on previous experience. And so what I want to talk about is a little bit of this different spectrum of technology, digital technology, and how they can be useful in the context of a circular economy. So, um, of course, those slides will be shared with you and uh, you'll get my contact. Um, I want to go through them reasonably quickly so that we can get into a conversation. So I don't need to give you an overview on, on C. This was more for my own reference. Um, but the role that digital technology in the circular economy sort of overall ecosystem can be at many, many different levels. So I want to unpack some of these and, and illustrate with, with some examples. Um, this is a, a diagram here that sort of tries to capture those different levels. Um, on, the, on the left hand side is a triangle that you may have seen that starts with uh, the sort of lowest level that's the connected resources. Then we go into data. So connected resource, think of gadget that measure air quality, for example, but there's many others that generates data. From that data, we want to go into information. So think of data as binary one and zero, and information is something that you can read. The next level is you look at the weather, for example, so you've got the temperature, but then based on your own understanding, way of living, etc., you derive some knowledge. And from that, you derive some wisdom. So you see how this is going up. So the whole sort of value chain of uh, data, information, knowledge, and wisdom is something that is very important and dear to those of us working in information uh, technology because we try to go as far as possible in the higher sphere. How do we use technology to support the knowledge development and, and get to wisdom so that we all better humans and in our context, make the circular economy work better. And then on, on the other side, you see how there's very specific entry points in the context of, of circular economy. And I want to talk about some of these. Uh, so broadly, some of the opportunities around the use of digital technology for circular economy, one big adder is around improving uh, efficient, efficiency sorry, and effectiveness in, in resource management. And this is true in, in general technology Digital technology, sorry, I've been around for a while. Um, we, we've all got on the computer bandwagon some 30 something years ago. 
Uh, we got onto the internet roughly about 20 years ago on the smartphone about 10 years ago. And that revolution that's happening now on AI is the, is the new phase that will help us to be more uh, efficient and effective in general and in resource management especially. Um, a, a separate sort of area of work around circular economy is uh, the creation of circular platform and networks. So network in both the technology sense but also the technology that supports the human network, equally uh, important. Uh, I think this is one thing that I'll, I'll keep repeating and that will be, I hope, one of the key takeaway of this presentation is that technology can support other area and doesn't necessarily have the ambition, the need, or even the appetite to be in the middle. We see a lot of interventions that are technology driven, I think, and many people have been working in, in that space of technology for development for a while, know that technology needs to come in support or, or move the needle, but shouldn't be at the center. Then the other bits that I want to talk about a little bit is innovation and circular economy. There's some really interesting work that's been done. And again, there's the digital and the non-digital innovation uh, space around circular economy and, and in, in general. And then what role can digital technology have in enhancing education awareness and participations at different levels from the citizen to the policy makers, um, et cetera. Um, I'll try not to talk too much about the challenges, but I think we should be clear about this, that yes, the use of technology do have negative environment and social um, uh, impact. Um, E-waste is the most obvious, again, in our context of, of circular economy. And I think there were some discussions uh, earlier in the workshop about interesting initiatives around e-waste. Um, there, there's been a, a lot of interesting experiment and, ex and use of digital technology. In some cases, those have sort of reinforced the issue around um, economy gap and uh, gender gap sometimes and, and inequality. So let's make sure that when we look at digital technology, those, those approach do not reinforce those inequalities. Uh, there's a lot of challenges around ethical and legal issues. I'm not going to go back to my opening slide that is chat GPT generated, but right now there's a lot of discussions around copyright infringements, for example, and how do we make sure that the authors of original content are duly compensated for their work and in a, in a fair and transparent way. Um, and then there's the sort of elephant in the room once you start talking about technology in general and, and more recently AI specifically is around the job loss and disruption. And those are, are real challenges that needs to be tackled um, there's a whole trajectory about upskilling people, for example. Uh, those are important challenges when it comes to uh, digital. So I want to give you a couple of examples to move from what may seem to be a bit of a theoretical uh, conversation here. Uh, example of the use of uh, digital technology for, for circular uh, economy around those um, different elements. So some of you may or may not have seen, but out there, there are some uh, digital platform uh, in the context of uh, waste management and recycling. And again, this is in the context of making the process of circular economy, one of the aspects of the uh, circular economy process, uh, more efficient. Um, I've joined ADB five years ago, was working in Africa mostly with the UN previously, so some of my examples are, are from there. Um, but countries, large countries like Nigeria uh, have been uh, pretty much at the forefront of using the digital technology for, for waste management with all sort of technology that are both sort of high-end and innovative and more major technology. Think of SMS, you know, for example, uh, for, for planning. Uh, and then there's also, again, linked to the, the social issues with job disruption and, and displacement, uh, employment opportunities for digital um, in the context of informal uh, waste workers engagement. Um, so those are examples. Uh, you see two from uh, from Kenya, one from uh, from India. Um, I'll provide the links, but those are really interesting examples that have been around for a few years and are quite successful in terms of the use of digital for waste management and recycling platform. Um, 
Uh, blockchain, this was mentioned uh, briefly by our speakers, uh, one of our speakers from the, from the Philippines, uh, Nenet, right? I pronounced her name right. Um, blockchain is basically a piece of digital technology that allows traceability, which again, in the context of circular economy, is, is a very useful uh, aspect. And she mentioned, I didn't know that, admittedly, that uh, they were using it in the context of the, the plastic uh, credits uh, initiative. And, and this is a piece of technology that is actually pretty low cost to deploy. And so it's been uh, used pretty successfully in different uh, uh, contexts and example. So for example, a BankQ, uh, this is a block blockchain platform to create sort of economic passports. So again, somehow link with the plastic credits that she was talking about um, yesterday. Then the use of blockchain for traceability um, and to enhance the transparency around supply chain. Um, that's also a very good example of using digital technology. Uh, another uh, digital technology that I want to mention briefly is called IoT. It's the Internet of Things. They are small device that allows to measure all sort of stuff. So uh, whether it's temperature, pressure, movement, um, or, or other elements, um, and they're, they're pretty cheap. They can be tagged uh, to parcels. Um, and or, or bundles of waste in our context. Um, and these IoT, these Internet of Things, are very useful to monitor and optimize um, resource management, whether natural or not. Uh, so this is another example um, that has been used in, uh, in different contexts. Again, examples of uh, coming from Sub-Saharan Africa, where they've used it for uh, tractors, for example, to make the sharing economy more efficient. Uh, another piece of digital technology, and we have an example here at ADB, if you've never seen one at the Innovation Hub, of 3D printing for local production. So 3D printing is our, our gadget device uh, that allow, as the name implies, to print uh, 3D elements that are useful in the context of repairing objects. So again, think of the circular economy in that context. Uh, and there's been examples in different parts. Um, AI, because this is a piece of digital technology that you've heard about recently, there's been tremendous advance because there's more data available and there's more computing power available. So AI have really made some tremendous pro uh, progress in the past 12, 18 months. It's still going strong. Uh, this is useful, again, in our context of, of circular economy in terms of analyzing large data set to identify patterns uh, and also to, to create sort of new pathways uh, around issue, for example, tra uh, whether it's traceability or resource management uh, or others. Uh, this is an example, a company called Stuffster, uh, that used the AI for circular economy analytics so that they, they derive interesting insights on work that uh, retailers especially um, are, are working on in terms of buyback and, and circular economy in the context of uh, fashion. Um, I've talked a little bit broadly earlier about challenge and opportunity. I, I really want to stress that uh, they're, they're both sides of this. And any intervention, and I'd be happy to discuss specific with you and see how ADB can support this, but both sides need to be considered. I think it was mentioned, I don't know if it was James yesterday or other, another speaker, say, you know, if you come up with an intervention, make sure that it doesn't disrupt another part of that value chain. And, and digital, um, can can be very beneficial. We also need to look at the side effect of this. And, and one thing that I always preach, and, and and I was kind enough to read sort of my official ADB uh, uh, CV. I work on digital innovation here at at ADB, but I'm very conscious that a lot of interesting intervention around digital technology may not necessitate innovation technology or emerging technology like AI or blockchain. There's some pretty major digital technology and, and on the one side of the spectrum is SMS. SMS is beyond major. It's been around for 40 years. It's very stable. That are very interesting in the context of circular economy and very stable. And then there's other parts, you know, putting a portal and, and getting citizens engagement, et cetera, uh, is something that is totally worthwhile. Um, so need to, to find the right balance between um, innovation and more major uh, technology. 
I want to give a few examples of uh, digital platform. So those are in the context of crowdsourcing. How do we use digital technology to identify innovative solution that may or may not be digital, but that may uh, come from the citizen or startup that uh, have been working in different parts of the world in, in this context. ADB has put up its, uh, op it's called open innovation, meaning we call anybody to bring innovation to us. It's open innovation platform a few years ago, challenges.adb.org. So on a regular basis, we call for solutions. Now, the flip side of that is the solutions catalog. So we make available the thousands of solutions that have been uh, brought to ADB's attention. Many of them have received some mentorship from our operation colleagues so that they are more tailored to the needs of countries we're serving in, in the region. Um, I just want to bring to your attention another solution catalog that's coming from Solar Impulse. I don't know if you know of this initiative, this, this Swiss guy that went around the world on a solar plane. So he's got a foundation and they've put up this and this is open access with, with lots of detail for each solution. Uh, things that have been proven. There's not only a technology solution, digital or not, but a business uh, case that's associated. Very useful. Uh, in terms of support that we ADB uh, can provide, if you're interested, um, and, and more broadly beyond ADB, of course, also uh, two, two important elements is on the startup ecosystem, and our colleagues from um, uh, Thomas Abel team are doing this very well. How do we support in a given country a startup ecosystem so that there's thriving innovation and nurturing of, of solution? A and then a look at supporting beyond the initial sort of small experiment, but how do we scale? And this is something that we can also support and can link you up with partners who can do that. So just to conclude, um, sorry, um, there is definitely a role of sort of integrating digital technology and more broadly technology into circular economy. Um, there are very specific entry points that are worth exploring and see what other countries have been doing in that sense. Uh, leveraging a digital innovation uh, of multiple sort of beneficial aspects. Uh, it can enhance resources, it can create jobs, uh, and it can contribute to this more global uh, trajectory by connecting people, just like the, the solution catalog that I mentioned. And then use also uh, digital technology in terms of research, but also policy development. There's some interesting experiment in using digital for policy development, especially in the context of being more sort of data-driven, evidence-based decision-making. Um, so this, I think I've, I've mentioned a couple of key message that I want to leave you with. So um, very often we equate technology to those phones that we carry around. There's much more to it, and many of you know about this. So that's an important thing. I'm not a, a waste expert, but there's really interesting technology around this, and technology can support the deployment of those. And then the sort of balance between mature technology and more emerging innovative technology is also a, an important one. I, I, I like leaving people with key takeaway. I hope there's one thing you remember from that is this. Um, so find the right anchor uh, for the work. Um, what is it that you're trying to do and use digital as an enabler. Don't start with digital driving this. It usually doesn't work if you do this. Uh, pick the right uh, digital technology, whether major or uh, more emerging, is, uh, is key. Uh, yesterday, I thought um, James and other presenters talked about system thinking. Uh, digital technology can play a role in supporting that broader system thinking uh, approach, which is absolutely key. Um, and, and finally, I've mentioned it uh, briefly, but there is a role on, on digital for policy. I know there's a lot of conversation during this workshop on policy. What role can uh, digital technology play in, in policy conversation, even policy development. There's been interesting uh, experiments uh, around this. And then having the link between upstream and downstream, how do we get citizens to mobilize around this, but also the policymaker to have a better understanding of the different issues that are at stake. And, and digital technology can play uh, a really important role in facilitating this. Thanks. I think I'm running out of time. So thank you very much for your attention. Please drop me a line. I'm going to be here on and off the, today, and I think I'll be joining you tomorrow. Thank you very much for your attention. And I managed not to break my glasses. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you, Mark. Um, we'll invite you again for the question and answer after our second speaker. Um, I love how you ended your presentation by saying that digital is not um, not the driver, but should just be an enabler. Because sometimes we get so caught up in digital, we get we get so attracted without thinking of how it'll impact the communities that we work with. And um, you also gave a good reality check of like the issues and the the possible um, impacts it can have, which is what we talked about in the earlier um, panel about how circular economy can impact certain communities. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Gary Moise. He is currently the Development Director and Regional Manager for Asia of Sureka or Veolia. He has notable expertise in wastewater, drainage, stormwater, and waste engineering and research with a strong background in numerical modeling and environmental and operational data analytics. He is currently the project director of this TA, which is promoting action on plastics pollution from source to sea in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Gary, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Um, thank you very much, Mark, for doing the introduction. Uh, so there's uh, a lot that you said there that uh, I, I don't need to speak about, so I can, be, I can be very quick. I have as well a mea culpa. I'm not a waste management expert. I have my team over there who are waste management experts. I'm a, I'm a water storm drainage expert and was involved in developing artificial intelligence in, uh, in uh, wastewater management a few years ago. So I'm going to talk today a little bit about the work we're doing with ADB. Um, which is on plastic waste, uh, promoting action on plastic pollution from source to sea. It's a project we started almost, what, uh, getting on for almost 18 months ago. Uh, we are focusing on uh, four, uh, four developing member countries, uh, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, and Vietnam. Um, so I'll just go quickly introduce who we are, and it's for me to, to command that. Okay, so, um, well, we are part of the Veolia Group, which is 43 billion euros worldwide. It's the largest operator in water and waste worldwide, world, world number one provider of environmental services, um, particularly focused in waste management, particularly in this region. And I think we have 14 plastic waste recycling plants in the region, uh, of which one is found in Indonesia, and I'm gonna say a few words on that. Uh, we, are, we are the consulting wing, and so you might see that we are 40 million in a very large company of 40 billion. Okay, but we work for the group, and we were, we were very lucky to, uh, very fortunate to win this project, uh, this fantastic project working uh, in this region uh, almost two years ago now. We're working with DT Global, which is a, uh, a worldwide company, American company, who are now working with us on this. Our scope of work, well, it's basically covering the four beneficiaries. Uh, Thailand, and there we're working more on national regulations. In Indonesia, we're working on city action plan for Chiribon City. Uh, Philippines, we're working on a rather large chunk of uh, Manila, Manila City. Luckily, we're not working on Greater Manila, which is, you know, a bit of a large chunk. We're working on a city action plan for the city of Manila, 1.8 million inhabitants. And in Vietnam, uh, we're working on Tan An City, which is, again, more of a sizable project of 250,000, 15,000. Um, in, we work developing city action plans for plastic waste uh, and for waste management in the, in those cities because we, as well, as I'll come to say in a few minutes, um, without working on, plas on, on the whole waste management stream, you cannot impact plastic waste. The two go in hand. Uh, we are working since about uh, six months on a particular piece, which is looking at uh, digital applications. Um, and it's been divided in this sense in which we have a developing a digital roadmap, screening of digital solutions, and this will see, and uh, Mark has introduced a number of digital solutions, and in fact there's a whole host, an amazing amount of innovation in this area. So we've been looking at the global landscape of digital solutions and trying to hone down to those that might be applied regionally and those that are being applied regionally to try to then test those digital solutions in two of the uh, sit, taking the city action plans and testing it, particularly in Tanan and in, in Chiribon. And I'll come to some 
elements with regard to Chiri Bon, getting some feedback from that to develop the knowledge projects uh, at the end. So that's basically an assignment that's going to be going on basically for the rest of this year, uh, going on from the city action plans. Um, this gives us a little bit of, a, of the approach. So we are analyzing and we've more or less finished, I think we finished the global screening. We are now working on the regional solutions, the regional screening, and identifying those solutions that can be applied to our pilot in uh, Tanan and, and Chiribon. Um, so let's have a look. There's a whole, we talked about what is upstream and downstream innovations in the sense of the circular economy. And so going from manufacturing, uh, the start off point, where you have a lot of artificial intelligence, data analysis, that all of the, and I think Coca-Cola talked about this, uh, using, of course, more recyclable products in their manufacturing. Uh, and there's lots of changes in manufacturing. Uh, we see the going from, uh, you have a famous um, uh, bottle uh, of, um, in, in France, which it used to be a green bottle, a green plastic bottle, and now it's a white, you know, it's a see-through plastic bottle, so that it can be more easily recycled. And we saw that with uh, Coca-Cola. Um, you have blockchain for, uh, for EPR. You then go through to consumption and impacting consumption. Um, plastic footprint calculators, greenhouse gas calculators, uh, raising awareness, diff different digital apps, different digital apps for monitoring, because without monitoring you can't manage. And then a whole host of apps that are more in the operations, uh, going from you know, connecting waste generators with collectors, and that we're seeing uh, very, very prevalent in operational optimization for collection. We have a, getting the informal sector and trading with the informal sector and working with the informal sector, not replacing the informal sector, but reinforcing that informal sector and trying not to break it down, trying to make the informal sector more efficient to do more work, to collect more, and also, also to have better conditions for the informal sector. Uh, and so bringing that whole chain, and they're just coming to our analysis. Uh, so we've analyzed 152 different applications worldwide, uh, and that's expanding. We see 30, we see about 15 in terms of minimization of plastic waste, a lot of applications in terms of monitoring plastic pollution, and without monitoring, you can't manage. So that's very key. And then a whole host of more than 150 different applications in relation to processing and operations. But processing and operations comes from trading, sorting, collection, logistics, segregation, final disposal, recycling. So there's a whole host of different uh, types of aspects. And even in this region, so going from India through to here in the Philippines, you see almost 80 different applications and it's getting more and more each each time uh we've we've done the segregation and you can see more or less more or less the same number of a focus on collection and segregation um in terms of worldwide that's mirrored here in in the region a lot of focus on trading uh, of plastic waste and linking up the informal sector to the to in fact the formal sector to the people who need plastic waste for recycling. One of the difficulties that we, Veolia, but one of the difficulties that we, Veolia, are having is to have enough feedstock coming to our plastic waste recycling plants so that they can be optimized. So this is a, quite a nice example, and I think I'll focus a little bit on this. Um, so this is an example of uh, an application that's being used in Indo Indonesia today. Uh, it was developed by uh, Veolia in partnership with uh, a number of actors in Indonesia. And we have uh, Don Danone, like Coca-Cola, who, who, who are doing bottles and want to recover the bottles. So they are the uh, off-takers from the plastic waste recycling. And they've been involved in financing, co-financing with Veolia this operation. I think one of the interesting things of this is that we have not tried to break down the existing informal sector. We've tried to work with them and bring them in. So that you have today, you have the waste pickers, you have the smaller aggregators, 
And there we've tried to maintain that and improve the livelihood uh, of the waste pickers, but not touch that relationship between those aggregators and those waste pickers, but trying to enhance that. So we have done training. So we have about 3,000 uh, waste pickers who've been trained. Uh, they've improvements in terms of their livelihood. They're able to collect more waste, earn more money, and in better conditions. And that's what we've been focusing on. One of the key aspects as well that we're focusing on, because we haven't broken down that relationship, but we're wanting to ensure that we all know what happens in these, in these areas. You have child labor, forced labor in some of these countries to ensure that, that, that that's not taking place. So in parallel with this relationship, we've got an NGO doing surveys to ensure that there is not child labor in these activities. Okay, and that's, that's very important. I don't have the figures today of the gender, uh, but I'll, I'll get that for you in terms of that. But we've got to, you know, it's been very clear that there's been quite large improvements in the livelihood and improvements in the jobs for the waste pickers, which I think is key, which is key to making this whole thing, whole thing work. So this is one of the examples that we want to as well take this further. It's a, it's a blockchain, it's a blockchain uh, application, uh, which is proving very successful. I think it's been operating now for, for about three years. We want to take this one particularly further in the Chiribon case and try to apply it in Chiribon with the, some of the aggregators in Chiribon and try to apply that for this particular case. There are a whole other series of um, uh, applications and perhaps if any of you know about these applications in your country and have feedback, it would be interesting for you to tell us what you have felt fed back from that. So this one is in Vietnam and it's been, uh, it's been expanding rapidly from Vietnam called Equo. We have one called Cyclus. Um, we have one which particularly example, particular example in Brazil. We have a subsidiary in Brazil and Viola is working in Brazil. And uh, we've had quite a lot of information on this one. And it's been particularly successful, increasing income by almost 60%, 10 minutes left, and uh, waste collected by 50%. It's been very successful in Brazil. Um, we have Collect, which has been uh, a little bit, uh, it's had some difficulties and particularly in Indonesia hasn't been particularly successful we understand in Indonesia because of the uh, because of the fact that it needed to have uh, the problem in, in relation to um, having telephones and smartphones and the waste pickers did not have access to smartphones it's been applied now again in Mozambique and has been more successful so perhaps this is one we can relook at uh, Bauer uh, another one in India but we, there are, as we said, hundreds of these applications. So what we're trying to do is to hone down to maybe a handful that we will try to use in, in each case study. Just some conclusions, the benefits of these digital solutions. Well, uh, we talked about their low cost, their scalable solutions for raising awareness. Uh, we can improve uh, quantity and quality of plastic waste recycling improve segregation rates, improving reuse rates. Clearly, we see that there are benefits to the informal sector, particularly in terms of livelihood. And this is very important when we're doing, a, a, anyone who's doing a waste project with the ADB knows that we, the, the, one of the key issues is working with waste pickers and improving their, their livelihoods and making sure that they benefit from the project as well as the general public. Uh, it, they have an increasing volume an increasing volume collected, which of course is what we want to see because we want to in increase the amount of uh, recyclable material that's reintroduced into the system and have less single-use plastics being uh, used in the whole system and increase of volume collected, increase of income to the waste pickers. And this is very clear that we see between 20 and 50% increase in the uh, waste pickers uh, revenue. This enables traceability for EPR schemes. Uh, clearly, we have improved, we can have improved working conditions for waste pickers, increasing their digital literacy, uh, ability to have savings accounts, and also improving the per perception of the waste pickers profession. So we've got the transformation of some of these waste pickers, they're beginning to have contracts. And so in the case uh, of, the, uh, of the Indonesian example, we had about 
250 new contracts being developed and they actually have contracts so it's not just informal they have formal contracts now funding comes from a variety of solutions we have the epr schemes we have csr schemes so companies such as veolia uh, we have danone coca-cola talked about that this morning so we have a, a whole series of funding from that we have the alliance to end plastic waste which is a let's say a large uh, CSR scheme of a number of uh, plastic manufacturers who are getting involved who want to see improvements, private funding and donations, and of course we have uh, ADB, World Bank, who are investing in these projects uh, as well. The challenges, well I think it's, so there's a lot of challenges, uh, we need good enabling conditions, um, difficulty in the waste pickers actually using some of these applications. Uh, they don't have smartphones, they don't have necessarily have access to smartphones, and, and providing some access uh, is important. I won't talk about that because I don't have much time. Um, I'd just like to say just a, a, a little example on how what we've said there could have some uh, reductions in, in terms of the case of Chiribon. So at the moment we are finalizing the action plan for Chiribon City and we hope to deliver that within uh, let's say about a month and there are a whole series of actions. What we must realize, what we need, need to realize of course is that improving plastic waste management goes hand in hand with improving municipal solid waste management. Doing, do, without doing if you don't improve municipal solid waste management, you're not going to improve plastic waste management. Okay? However, plastic waste management can be a lever for also introducing financing and improving municipal solid waste management. So that's something that we're seeing. Now, in the case of Chiribon, we have about 13 or 14,000, let's have a look at the Sankey diagram, 14,000 tons per year of plastic waste coming into the system. Okay, and of that today, um, about 8,000, 8,500 8 tons is mismanaged plastic waste. Okay, so that's, um, so some of it is being disposed to the dump site stroke landfill. Okay, so we consider that still to be mismanaged. Still that to be mismanaged. Uh, some is sorted for recovery, uh, but we're not too sure where it goes. And even uh, and then when it goes somewhere, you probably got about 25% of that is probably lost again. And then we've got a whole large percentage which is completely lost in the system. So the challenge is to reduce the amount of plastic waste coming into the system by recycling con considerably more and having a lot less, of course, going directly into the environment. So this is the challenge and this is what we're trying to put together. Um, now, we're trying to look at that from the case of looking at the overall municipal solid waste management system in Chiribon and trying to do improvements, not just in plastic waste management, but in solid waste management itself. Now, I won't go through all the details of that um, and what we're trying to do, but looking at also improving the final disposal of the landfill, improving the landfill, improving collection, uh, recycling at a number of cases. Now, it's quite interesting that when you start looking at that, you can start looking at greenhouse gas emissions as well as a driver for financing and improving the system. Now, looking at the amount of waste uh, in terms of uh, coming from greenhouse gas emissions, we have about 40, 47,000 tons coming from, from the landfill, 4,000 4, just from, from the waste collection, uh, this is a digital platform that we that Veolia has developed for looking at greenhouse gas emissions uh, across all of our activities and we're using it on a number of external projects as well looking at the direct emissions indirect emissions etc now what we've looked at is recovery of the different plastic waste additional recovery of waste at the landfill uh, the waste landfill with a capture and biogas recovery so that we can see that we can reduce, uh, so this gives us an idea of the reductions. Looking at plastics, we're not really having a great deal of reduction from the baseline. We've estimated about 51,000 tons equivalent CO2 per year 
with no plastic recycling. The plastic recycling only reduces four to 5,000 tons per year, but then working at the level of the municipal solid waste, we're having very large reductions in CO2 emissions, 60% 60, 60 reductions in CO2 emissions. So this project will have, let's say, what we're looking at as a driver for the project is two aspects, reducing the amount of solid waste going into the environment, having more recycling, and also looking at reducing greenhouse gas emissions and improving the whole solid waste uh, management stream in, in Chiribon. I have probably one minute. Yes. Okay. So very quick conclusions. Uh, so we see that the whole host, there's 150, 200 applications looking at minimizing plastic waste upstream, monitoring, and monitoring is very important because without monitoring and understanding better, you won't be able to manage, and a whole host of different plastic waste operations. Uh, the enabling environment is important, in awareness, accessibility, affordability of the solutions. Innovations can help in the, case, in the case of Collect, they've introduced facial recognition into the applications, which is improving, it's coming overcoming some of the problems to begin with. Clear, clear benefits from the digital applications, while improved traceability and quantification for EAPR schemes is very clear. Enhanced waste collection, and we see, as I said, between 20 to 50% improvement in waste collection with the use of these applications. And uh, a very important thing is increased welfare, increased income, better welfare, welfare for the waste collectors at the same time. So we are maintaining their uh, livelihood, improving their livelihood, because we need them to work more. We need to collect more. So we don't want to break that down. We want to improve it. Potential benefits, well, very large benefits in terms of reducing mismanaged waste, which is after all what is about these, these projects. And together with uh, the whole waste management stream, very large improvements in greenhouse gas uh, emissions, uh, because as we know, waste is one of the big elements for greenhouse gas emissions in cities, in urban areas. So, okay, so that's where we are today. We are going to be, in the next few months, finalizing this activity in terms of identifying the applications to be applied in Tanan and Chiribon, and applying some of these applications. And I think particularly the one that Viola is already using in uh, Indonesia for our plastic waste recycling plant in Surabaya, we will be uh, applying that in the case, together with others that we'll be testing in, in the region. So, Thank you very much. I've, we've got a lot of information in there, um, a lot more than I can talk about. I also just say that we're, for the questions and answers, as I said, I'm not a waste management expert. I've got two colleagues here who are. So I have Vincent as our team leader at the back. Okay, stand up, Vincent, who's been driving this project now for over a year. And I have Francois, Francois Jenny from Operations of Veolia, who's been very much in the development of the Plasti, Plasti Loop operation of, of Veolia. So any hard questions, it's for them, not for me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gary. We'd like to invite Mark to join us here um, in front. And we are opening the floor for questions. I know that tech and innovation has been a big topic on people's minds. So if you're ready with your questions, and just raise your hand, introduce yourself, and let us know who the question is for. Yes. We have two questions already, so we'll start here in front. Another question. So we have three questions. It's Anna uh, from Indonesia. Um, in recent year, in Indonesia, uh, are, go, uh, are growing up uh, for the waste uh, technology application. Um, we 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 uh, we identified more than 200 application on waste management, but currently uh, one by one are die, and not uh, and cannot sustain. Um, we don't know uh, whether there is no uh, lack of demand or 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 the or our community uh, cannot be aware uh, didn't aware about this application or not uh, or not yet. yet. What um uh, uh, what what will uh, uh, my question is um uh, can you share your experience 
what the gov uh, what the role of government to 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 involve uh, this uh, issue because we think that uh, as a government this is the um, market market area uh, market player so we we cannot directly to to involve mm. the the market uh, yeah yeah, so Thank you. there are so many apps that have been developed for waste management, but a lot have died or disappeared from the marketplace. And what is the role of government to support or to help them stay alive? Okay. A big opportunity to grow up this application yes, because yes, we have definitely. Um, um, the, the huge number of young generation. Yeah, in, who in can Indonesia's. use this yeah. yeah but we don't know the, the ex existence of the application cannot be grown yeah okay maybe you want to start yeah. mark yeah I, very shortly uh, very briefly one aspect one approach sorry that works is the partnering with existing apps so in indonesia partner with gojek you know um and surely it's more complicated than that but i've seen this in in large countries where they try to launch their own individual app and it's difficult to get traction with the moment they shifted to an existing app that provides other services and then the linkages between those services like transport and all the other services that gojek the super app is providing can provide the linkages also that is useful so perhaps I could, I, I, in fact, I think the question is an excellent question. It's a, it's a billion dollar question for plastics. Eh? So there are many, many um, entrepreneurs out there who are developing these apps. Some of them do it on their own. They find a little niche and they go do it, okay? Now, the waste business is constantly changing just as the plastic value chain is. So. That's why some of them drop out. Uh, one of the ways to ensure that you have some success is if you find a, a, a solution, you find a problem in the value chain and you can use, you can find a solution that works to turn this into a circular model and you can bring along with you some partners to collaborate with, you know, possibly some FMCG brand along with you, then you have a very good um, chance of success. Now, what can governments and policymakers do? Now, this is a really important one. And, you know, I would say, please focus on enabling market instruments to thrive. You know, so we need market instruments that will create uh, a, a demand for uh, these sort of solutions to actually work. Because you will notice also, you know, we have a lot of examples where in the countries in our region where you have collection, uh, you have, you know, sorting, etc. happening, but then the product is actually sent abroad. It's not done, uh, it's not done domestically. So that means you know, we also need to some to create local demand. So these are the areas maybe a government and policymakers should focus on. That's what I would I would uh, recommend. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have last two questions. One in this table, and then here. Yeah. Hi, I, I'm Peter Pete Holt from ADB Risk Management. W one question, probably very dumb questions. I, I wonder why when manufacturing manufactured a plastic bottle with PET, right? Why did they not put the caps and everything else in PET so the whole thing can be easily recyclable? Um, that, I mean, that's one kind of question I wonder. Mm -hmm. And also could PET be used for other product like bottle, like shampoo and everything other things? Because then, then you standardize everything then make the whole circular economy easier to implement. Just, Okay, uh, I forgot to say earlier, Vincent mentioned the abbreviation FMCG that stands for fast moving consumer goods. So that's like beverages, food, snacks, etc. Um, so the question is, this is a good question. Um, PET bottles or plastic bottles where our soda and our water is, it's made of three kinds of plastic. Like the bottle itself is different, 
the cap is different, the label is different. So why not just one entire plastic type? Uh, I will take this one. Uh, it would be my dream, you know. I receive a bottle in my plant, all in PET, no label, uh, no ink. Uh, just simple shredding, uh, minimizing the resource perfect product which can be reused, unfortunately, it doesn't work. Why it doesn't work, and this is a question, uh, is the property of the material. Uh, you cannot make a cap, unfortunately, in PET, mm. uh, so that doesn't work. Uh, and for uh, making some other packaging uh, for cosmetics, for example, etc., in PET, uh, currently we use a lot of PP, HDP. Uh, it's because of the property of the material uh, based on the liquid you are currently storing in. Uh, so PET application is uh, very good for uh, food contact bottle. Uh, doesn't need to have a very uh, uh, high strength. Uh, when you will find PP and HDP mainly in a shampoo bottle or uh, etc. Now, what is important for all the packaging industry? Because here we're mainly focusing on packaging, is to integrate in the design uh, about circularity. That means how can I minimize the different kind of uh, uh, of different kind of plastic in my product, uh, and the plastic or whatever material I'm going to use, make sure it's easy to dismantle, it's easy to recycle, and that's uh, so. When we are talking about uh, design circularity, this is a very important topic which is coming a bit upstream. Thank you. Um, so different types of plastic are used for different applications. It's the summary of the, the answer. So it's important to design for circularity, whatever the type of material is. And we have one last question here. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I really found um, you know, both presentation really inspiring to see the digital adoption across the entire waste value chain and, and across the circular economy. In particular, I was really interested to follow up uh, with the example you share from Chirban, because you really see the data of what can be achieved, the uh, GHG emissions reduction that can be achieved if the digital solutions are integrated and adopted by the city. So the question I had is, um, right now you're showing that you know there's a significant reduction of GHG emissions through the biogas uh, capture, right? Whereas plastic collection contributes to a smaller percentage of the GHG emissions reduction. From a priority perspective, you know, with the city's planning, would they prioritize on tackling uh, the segment of the waste value chain that can achieve the most uh, GHG emissions reduction first? Um, and then secondly, in terms of how they can prioritize the, the policy actions as well as the investments that can help them optimize the uh, resources that they have with the entire waste management chain that can achieve the highest impact in terms of GHG emissions reduction or potentially revenue generation through carbon credits or um, other types of revenue. Thank you. Do you introduce yourself? Oh, yes. Hi, Christine Chan from the uh, Urban Sector Group with ADB. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So the question is on prioritizing um, GHG emissions, waste reduction, and revenue generation. So uh, the model that uh, Gary showed uh, really looks at both the uh, waste collection operations, waste management operations, and what is happening at the dump site, okay, or the, or the final the TPR, they call it, the final dump site. Um, now, the majority of, this, of the uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction is coming from the organic part if we capture the uh, landfill gas because plastics itself you know the breakdown in emission is takes a very long time in fact in the model that we use you only show significant um, emissions uh, after 30 years so we haven't quite factored that in but the savings come from the efficiency in improving the operations making the uh, sorting facilities more efficient. So it's coming from uh, emissions from vehicles, trucks, and all that, you know. So most of the savings is coming from uh, capturing the landfill gas, yeah, and improvements on, on, on operations, really. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. Well, obviously, we know uh, prioritization. Uh, we can't go uh, quickly enough to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and clearly, that we have to prioritize. Uh, that has to be a priority. Uh, we also have to understand as well that it's also uh, a very good mechanism for leveraging financing for these very hard to finance projects. Uh, we all know that solid waste and wastewater in the past been very difficult to finance and people haven't been cost recovery is difficult people haven't want, want to finance so with all these financing climate financing schemes that exist it's a mechanism by which we can get um, grant financing into this area so I think that's pri that's primary and then we have a course today uh, if you look at any solid waste project that is being financed by a donor it's plastic waste and municipal solid waste we see that, uh, and, and so I think we have to do both at the same time. I think we have to do both at the same time and use intelligently the push on plastic waste to improve municipal solid waste, because without with improving municipal solid waste collection, you won't be able to improve plastic waste. You're improving the livelihoods, as we've seen, and we have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions extremely quickly, uh, particularly, of course, in all the landfill, well, land, landfills, dump sites, that we have in this region. There are thousands of dump sites in this region. They're all pushing out methane everywhere. And unless we do something quickly, we are we are in a catastrophic situation. And you can do me you can do methane measurements, we can see from satellites, we can see it coming out everywhere. There's emissions coming out everywhere, much more than we are calculating from all of these very theoretical models. Thank you. And that's the point I wanted to add on what I what we didn't show you in the model is the plastics in our dump sites do burn and they release greenhouse gas emissions as well. So maybe that's not very obvious, but it's if we don't have plastics in the landfill, much better. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, let's give our, our panelists and our guest panelists a round of applause. <laughs> we have Gary, Mark, Vincent and Francois. Thank you so much for that, that, um, that discussion on tech and innovation. So 